Okay, thank you. Do you hear me? Yeah, okay, excellent. Um, thank you for inviting me. And I really uh, think you're doing an um, extremely important job these days. Um, in many ways, you're uh, swimming against the current. And um, <clears throat> this is not an easy mission that you're taking upon yourself, especially these days, and especially probably in Germany. Um, so I really admire uh, your persistence, your courage, and uh, your readiness to dedicate yourself to what appears to me as just causes. Uh, <laughs> I'm by my profession, I'm a lawyer. Um, I uh, practiced law for several years as well, uh, but then I did uh, my doctorate in legal philosophy. And since then, since about 15 years, I've been teaching uh, legal theory, uh, legal philosophy, law and culture, um, cultural studies sometimes. So I'm, I'm a little bit undisciplined uh, in this regard. Um, so I teach the law school, sometimes some seminars at the philosophy department. I am director, co-director of the Minerva Center for the Humanities at Tel Aviv Universities, a university. Um, I'm based in Nazareth. I'm a Palestinian, as you can imagine, or you can't. Um, I'm a Palestinian and an Israeli citizen. Uh, I write on different subjects, among them Israel-Palestine, which there's no way to escape it if you live in this part of the world. Um, so I did some work on Israel-Palestine. Um, from time to time, I try to escape it for another some more theoretical issues. I do manage for a year or two, but then this uh, horny issue drags me back and I find myself uh, writing about it, uh, thinking about it uh, again and again. And I do think that actually Israel-Palestine really gives uh, enough fresh material to think the most important theoretical questions. I think this theory is the one that starts from very concrete sitting and ask about question that really um, at the core of a certain current painful, maybe a reality and try to think the universal, the global and the abstract uh, by pushing the concrete to its limit. So I think any philosophy should start from the concrete. Now, I mean, I want to say a few remarks. Um, I was invited roughly to say something about settlers and natives, uh, probably about Zionism as a settler colonial uh, movement. And I want to start like many times I do from a certain location and from a certain time. And I think we are now in 2020. Uh, there's something going on, the few things going on regarding Palestine. Uh, one of them is very much the deal of the century. The treaty or the agreement or the strategic alliance between uh, Israel and some Gulf states, which are in many ways are the implementation of Trump vision for Middle East. Um, and which try to brush aside the Palestinian question as the core issue in the Middle East and to argue actually that uh, peace could be achieved uh, directly by, by passing the Palestinian uh, question and normalizing relation with the, with the Arab world. Me as a Palestinian, I view this as an attempt really to uh, sabotage, to eliminate the Palestinian question, not to solve it, but to pretend that there is no Palestinian question anymore. Um, that what to solve, uh, everything is solved, peace for peace, and that's it. Um, so this is one of the sign of the time that we're living now, is this new 
the Trump deal that tries to shape the Middle East and try to move, if at one point in the 90s, until probably 27, until the last before, and until Olmert was in power, I think Israel was trying, regardless of intentions, of the possibility of, but there was in Israel some attempt to solve the Palestinian question, to reach a compromise. I think that was less what the, 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 the Israel couldn't offer anything that the Palestinian can accept. I think after that, probably for seven or eight years, we witnessed something um, that could be called the managing of the conflict. So giving up on the idea that we can reach any reconciliation or any settlement. Uh, so Israel with Netanyahu moved to the management of the conflict saying that what will be will be, what was will continue to be, there is nothing new and actually we can manage the populations and the management of the population is usually with issues of money with issues of security and that's all there is i think in the last three years since trump is in power there is an attempt actually to eliminate the problem by annexing east jerusalem as part of israel by normalizing with the arab states as if there is no palestinian question uh, and by giving a green light to Israel by the U.S. government to annex uh, parts of the West Bank, um, and by the attack on the UNRWA and trying to eliminate the questions of refugees. So the Palestinian question slowly was meant to be evaporating. So Jerusalem is out of the question, refugees are out of the question, the West Bank is becoming um, without any continuity or contiguity and uh, it's split into different zones so also the territorial question is being sort of eliminated then where is the palestinian question it's it's evaporating so this is one scene where we are holding this event uh, so it's important always to remember the setting when we are talking and the second scene, which I've been involved in it uh, pretty much lately, and I'm doing some, some work on this regard, is the new definition of antisemitism by the IHRA three, four years ago. And even worse of the definition itself, which is the definition could be somehow interpreted in a ways that are decent if you have really good intentions. But I think that uh, the IHRA was completely kidnapped and used and abused in a way that does three things at the same time, I think. Uh, first of all, um, is curtailing free speech all over. Uh, second, um, it's uh, pretty much um, used to silence Palestinian voices and Palestinian activists by claiming that any serious critique, not any critique, any serious critique or opposition to Israel or Zionism almost to be labeled as uh, anti-Semitic. So the first thing is free speech, the second is Palestinian silencing. The third thing, I think it's bad for anti-Semitism itself. I think a serious fight against anti-Semitism um, should be done in a way that really focus on the real anti-Semitism uh, that Jews are facing all around the world. Uh, instead of calling uh, the BDS anti-Semitic or any Palestinian who's calling for the right of return anti-Semitic. Means to call anybody who's calling for the right of return as anti-Semitic is tantamount to arguing that actually it's okay and moral uh, to expel people from their homeland. If not to expel at least to prevent and prohibit them from going back to their homes, not even homelands, to their personal homes. So I think under the guise of fighting anti-Semitism, we're facing a situation where under this pretext, uh, there is a perpetuating of statelessness. I think this is a bad thing to do for the memory 
of uh, the Holocaust first. Second, it's a bad thing for anti-Semitism. The fight for anti-Semitism should be never used in order to perpetuate situation of uh, persecution, statelessness, oppression, occupation, discrimination. I think true fighters against anti-Semitism should rebel against this um, abuse of the, uh, of the fight against anti-Semitism. And it's really, I think that the new definition, the way it has been appropriated by many countries, by many states, is really threatening the Palestinian narrative as well. Um, so that I don't know when the time will come that anybody who is making a comparison between Israel and South Africa would be accused of anti-Semitism, like myself. I, draw, I wrote two papers on that. Uh, I argue that there are similarities. There are dissimilarities, but the mere idea of making such comparison might be uh, under the new definitions and the way they have been called anti-Semitic. Um, calling Israel a settler colonial state, probably it would become something um, that would be considered racist against Jews. Uh, asking for equality, actually, because anybody who's denying that the, the right of Israel to be as a Jewish state, so if I want to have full equality, I want to say that Israel-Palestine is one unit, equal citizenship for all the citizens, as a collective and as individuals. So it's good to be by national state with full individual right as persons, as individuals, and full group rights as two nations. So asking actually for such an equality would be deemed and considered and labeled as anti-Semitic. So this is turning the whole logic upside down, actually where anti-Semitism might be deployed as a category against all ideas of human rights, against the idea of equality itself. This is the sitting. This is the reality under which we're acting. This is the reality under which you are acting as a group. Uh, and that's why I think what you are doing is extremely uh, important. So this has been said about the current sitting. Um, I would not give a, um, a full lecture here. Um, th that wasn't my aim, but I think given the fact that part of you are Europeans, part of you are Arabs or Palestinian, and probably part of you are Israeli Jews, it's interesting to see the picture of this triangle. Jews, Arab, Germany. What's the relation between these three? And while clearly the Jews in Europe were the ultimate victim of the last century, um, culminating in the Holocaust, um, their reality in Europe is clearly the reality of victimhood, probably the ultimate victimhood, uh, for sure for the 20th century. Um, I, some might argue not only for the 20th century, but for centuries. I, I don't want to enter this competition um, between Jews or American Indians or um, slavery and colonialism. Uh, I'm bad at that. But clearly for the 20th century, in terms of Europe, Jews are the other of Europe and the victim of Europe. And as such, um, I think they have valid arguments and valid claims against Europe and its racism. And we should support any claims that ask for uh, um, even compensation, rectification, uh, reparation from Europe for all those uh, crimes. Now, but how do the Palestinians enter into this story? I mean, uh, one should ask oneself is how the Palestinians enter this story. I mean, some of the Jews that came to Palestine, I, I'm, I think that they were uh, running for their life. Probably not immediately, but they were seeing the danger coming from Europe, from the rise of anti-Semitism. Uh, but being a refugee doesn't mean that you cannot be at the same time a settler. 
and the colonialist. So these categories do not exclude each other. And this is the point which is important to, to untangle. There is no relation of exclusion so that if you're a refugee, then you cannot be a colonialist, a settler colonialist. Or if Palestine, which is the land of Israel, has a spiritual status, and I do agree it has a spiritual and cultural status at the hearts of many Jews as an ancient homeland or as a place where uh, the, 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 the Jews became a nation two, three thousand years ago. I don't know. The fact that Israel, the land of Israel, Palestine, has a special status in the hearts and minds of many Jews, that doesn't mean if you're going there that you're not a settler colonialist. So the fact that you're a refugee doesn't mean that you're not a settler colonialist. The fact that Jews lived there 3,000 years ago, if they live, I don't know. I don't care if they lived. I'm not a com in competition. Uh, I don't think that anybody has a taboo uh, over land before 3,000 years. But even that fact, that doesn't mean that you're not a settler colonialist. Even if you didn't intend to expel the Palestinians. That doesn't mean you're not settler colonialists. I mean, the issue of intentions, it's, it's irrelevant for these purposes. And the fact that you, that you were victim is irrelevant for the fact that you're a settler when you come to Palestine. So the Palestinians see the settler, the soldier, the force, the power, the weapons coming with the settlers. Europe sees the back of those refugees running for their life. And that creates two different narratives about almost the same story. And we expect Europe actually to see things from our point of view, that we are in many ways the victim of the victim. And we are paying the price as Palestinian for a project that started in Europe. We are paying the price of Europe, European racism. We have to say that. And when the Jews have something, some account to settle with Europe, we should stand with them saying, yeah, Europe, you were racist and treated the Jews as racist. And you continue to be racist when you think that you want to solve the problem of the Jews at the expense of other nation. That's, that doesn't mean that you stop being in itself you want to be generous at the expense of other nations. So the issue of Israel, it's a little bit really complex in many ways. And that's why I think ex that explains probably why so many people on the left in Europe, many intellectuals from Sartre to Foucault to, to many others, who stood by so many revolutionary and anti-colonial movement, when the issue came to Israel, they were completely confused and took the part of Zionism, in part because we're thinking as French, because they saw they were not positioning themselves vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians. They acted as French, as Europeans. And they felt that anything between Europe and the Jews, the Jews were right because the Jews suffered as an ultimate victim in the 20th century. But we have to pay the price. We paid the price by being expelled from Palestine. If not expelled, you know, we ran away, okay? But when the war was over, we were prohibited to come back. So all of a sudden, Palestinians became refugees and they continue to be refugees. It's not a story of the past. There's a persistence of refugeeness. There's a persistence of statelessness. There's a persistence of more and more occupation and grabbing of Palestinian land in the West Bank every day. Literally every day there is more and more land grabbing in the West Bank. So I think that um, 
as a descriptive sociology and as a historical matter, there is no other way to view Zionism other than settler colonial project. Now, I tell some of my Jewish friends that relax, guys. You're not the first and the last settler colonial. Half of the world is settler colonials. Two Americas, settler colonials. New Zealand is so. South Africa is so. Northern Ireland, Australia. So half of the world is settler colonial. And to say that is to tell the story of how we got to this point. What does that mean is at least to take responsibility about the future, if not responsibility about the past, and to ask, okay, now what? You know, one of the differences between settlers and immigrants, it's not everybody that moves from one place to another is a settler. The immigrant comes running for his life and ready to be absorbed by the local community. He accepts the nomos accept the rules, accept the laws, the customs, or whatever. And he try to merge within the society that he is immigrating to. But the settler comes with his nomos, with his law, with his own sense of community. And he comes to push the local community, to shatter it, to fragment it, and as long the local community is not fragmented, there is ongoing process of continue to fragment the local community, which by definition brings with it practices of violence. Because he never feels secure until he fragments it or until he reach a historical compromise with the local community, with the local population, with the natives. So I think these are my introductory uh, remarks that I wanted to say uh, about Israel, Palestine, about um, settlers and natives. Um, I prefer to run this as a discussion because I don't know what, what direction you are interested to hear or what uh, lines you, you have interest to develop or what kind of argument to be engaged with. So, but I think that uh, I've already put on the table uh, some materials that can um, ignite some discussion, some rejection, or some um, can exert some reaction uh, from you. So I'll open up. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Ralf Zreck. You've definitely given us many, uh, uh, you, you've given us many doors and now we can start uh, opening them. Um, I welcome everyone to write questions in the chat if you have some, and I already have uh, a few. Um, and I think it's, it's nice actually that you, that, uh, I mean, you, you did give uh, um, uh, some some different uh, options. So uh, we'll, I'm, I'm curious to see what happens in the chat. Uh, and please, uh, no one be shy. And if you prefer that not everyone sees that you are asking the question, you can just send it to, to me in the chat, and I won't read the names. Um, I wonder if uh, you use the word the other, um, and I wonder if you could say a few words about what are the conditions in which the other um, is born or is the other already there and or like what what happens with this uh, who is this other and how is that related to um maybe in europe there is uh, this discourse on integration people have to integrate and i think in israeli society also jewish israeli um institution also uses this logic of integrating but actually who is supposed, so who is the other, who should integrate, if you don't mind saying uh, a, few, a few thoughts on that. Do you mean in Europe or in Israel, or uh, I used uh, the other, as, the Jew as the other uh, right. in Europe? Um, yeah, may, maybe uh, you're right, I wasn't, I wasn't very specific. Um, so what if, could you maybe abstract this idea of the other and uh, if we take it from um, 
from the Jew in Europe and look at uh, maybe uh, which other uh, Zionism uh, in the Middle East has created. Uh, are, they, are these things related to each other? Maybe something like that. Yeah, I mean, the other with the capital O is, is that in a way that cannot be integrated. Um, and the other in capital O is actually the, the non, the, the non possibility of integrated, it's non integratability. If you want to know the radical other, it's the radical other that it's not that you cannot integrate it, it's even the rejection of its integration cannot be integrated philosophically. So the other is remains opaque, different, exotic, completely inaccessible to reason, uh, unpenetrable, and as such is a source of danger in many ways. So he's not reachable. He's, he's something that beyond language, he's uncommunicable. Um, it's a black box. Um, and it's a sort of threat. And that's why when you do such othering, uh, usually it's end up in violence because you're not cutting something that could be thought as part of a, tota of a totality that you and him constitute different parts of it. Because if you think that way, then you would feel that you're losing something because you and him are part of a certain totality. So you're cutting part of this totality. So this is, should be painful. By doing the othering, um, you don't even integrate him in this totality. So you thingify him to the point that you don't experience the loss when you, when you do that. Um, anybody could turn to be the other, and anybody and anyone can do othering to others. So there is no one group that is. So Europe of yesterday could do othering to the Jews, the Jews could do othering to the Palestinians, uh, the Palestinians could do othering back to the Jews. So if nobody is immune from the violence of othering and nobody, um, actually the more you're a victim historically, the more that you feel sense of entitlement that you have God on your side and morality on your side uh, to the point that you are immune and uh, you might do othering uh, to other people to the point of violence. Othering usually ends up in violence and eradicating um, in the language of evil. Whenever you hear somebody speaking about evil, most evils in the world actually come when some people thought that the other is evil. Evil comes from the rhetoric of evil in itself. Um, so, yeah, I would stop here. Thank you. Um... I think I understood my question much better while you were answering it. <laughs> um, next question, to follow up, do you see nowadays in Israel slash Palestine moments where there are cracks in this uh, dichotom dichotomy, uh, dichotom uh, yeah, I don't know how to pronounce it in English, uh, where the other is humanized? So cracks. Yeah, th there's, yeah, the, there's always uh, um, there's always cracks. I mean, if there are not, we should we we have to see them. We have to invent them in our vision to see them. We cannot live without hope. Um, and I saw them through my through my life. So if if now we are uh, witnessing a certain let's say bleak and dark uh, times, um, I think there is there is despite the darkness, I think there is a, 
a growing acknowledgement deep that actually this place is binational. I think Israel, despite its superiority in terms of economy, military, and power, uh, they have confidence in the present. They don't have confidence in the future. There's something that is always in the future that is unclear. And, and from that, I think there is always this desire to find a way to a solution. Now, I don't see in the near future uh, any solution, I must say. But that's in part not because only the situation in Palestine. I think the global situation with what, what we are witnessing, the combination of right-wing populism with neoliberalism, I think if the U.S. wants to enforce a solution, they could enforce a solution tomorrow. Uh, but that's not happening now. Um, but I, I can imagine under different circumstances that this uh, might happen, actually. Yes. Um, okay, it's always a game between me and the audience, and I get to ask another question. Um, I want to go back uh, to something... No. I'll stick with what you just said, because uh, uh, if you speak about global and uh, I wonder um, uh, where, where we should place the question of, um, or the discourse on security, if you could maybe say a few words about security for the settler and security for the native, and where this, uh, uh, in this tension. The thing is, uh... The language of security is a tricky one. Historically, um, in the name of security, all empires expanded. So, because if you are a European landing in the US in the 17th century and grabbing the lands of the Indians, then you should expect the Indians to react. Uh, sometimes even forcefully, sometimes using violence. Now, in order to secure the territory that you already hold, you occupy further territory in order to have a security zone that guarantees what you've already had. But immediately after you have this security zone, you settle it as well. And then you feel the need actually to secure the new security zone. In history, there is a name for this. Uh, it's called defensive imperialism. So that most empires found themselves expanding and expanding even without a plan. They're just expanding with a mode of thinking that is defensive. Think of Israel. All of Israel rhetoric is defensive. Since all 48, 56, 67, 82, it's all rhetoric of defense. So, security is a tricky word. Now, I think that security becomes a fair category when we speak about rights. The most secure thing, and you get maximum security, when all people live in a just universe or a just state where the allocation of resources are done in a fair way. That's the way you guarantee security. To think of security without addressing justice means keeping the status quo, means that giving the Jewish supremacy carte blanche. I don't think that Jews have a right to security as long as they claim supremacy. No, I don't think. I don't think that occupation have the right to security. I think peace is not, is, it, it shouldn't be the Palestinian demand per se. The Palestinians are 
demanding justice and peace is the outcome of justice. If peace is the condition for justice, mean quietism and keeping the status quo. Quietism and keeping the status quo means continuation of the occupation. Continuation of Jewish privileges and supremacy. The Palestinians are under no obligation to guarantee Jewish security unless this security, this peace, is based on mutual recognition, on rights for all. Jews have the right to have their rights, but they don't have the right for privileges. They have the right to live equally, but not with Jewish supremacy. There's no reason that they feel that they are unique or they, that they have extra rights, at least in Palestine. Probably in Europe, they are entitled to feel that they deserve more given their past. But in Palestine, I don't see any reason why they should feel entitled to be superior to the Palestinians. Thank you. I think power and fear is uh, the next, next time we invite you, we'll, we'll have an extra <laughs> lecture just, just on that relationship. So there's one question that was written just uh, to me, so I will go to that and then there's another one after. Uh, can you please talk about the role of domestics and international legal uh, judicial tools that might help decolonization, I assume, of Palestine, based on your judicial legal background? Within Israel, um, adjudication is not really a tool uh, for Palestinians in the West Bank, completely not. I mean, the Israeli Supreme Court endorsed all crimes of the occupation. This is, has been documented, proved by many Israeli scholars, those who are interested, just click the name David Kritzmer, David Kritzmer, who wrote tremendously, proving thoroughly how the Supreme Court actually acted in a consistent manner uh, to allow the continuation of the occupation. Now, at certain point, uh, during the, probably during the 90s, probably I would say between 1995 after Oslo until 2005, probably there was some windows to use the legal system by Palestinian and Israel uh, to make some social change in their status. But the gains were minimal and whatever they won the case um, legally, in practice, they couldn't make any change practically. And I would say in the last 10 years, they, they're not even winning in theory. They, they're not winning in court uh, anymore. Internationally, I think there is a... International law um, is important for the Palestinian, not in the sense that the rulings of International Court of Justice or the UN could be implemented legally tomorrow. No, I don't have any such expectation. But it's important in order to master um, international solidarity and to crystallize the Palestinian demands morally in a way uh, that can actually create a solidarity movement around the Palestinian demands. So international law in many ways can do the work in order to um, crystallize the moral demands of the Palestinian, turn them into text, into resolution, into guidelines, uh, into criteria how to proceed forward. And in this sense, I think international law, I count on it, not in the sense that, as I said, it would be implemented. No, it will not be implemented. Nobody would implement. But it would give some legitimacy and justification for the continuation of the Palestinian struggle. Thank you. Um, next question. Hassan Hajj 
says in one of his books that what the Israeli-Palestinian conflict thought as uh, is that nationality has lost its relevancy. What is your stance regarding this issue, which abolished the two-state solution? Hassan Hajj argued that. Um, that nationality has lost its relevancy. Yeah, in one of his books, it doesn't say which one. Hassan or Ghassan? Ah, sorry, Ghassan. Yeah, G-H, Ghassan, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ghassan is a very smart guy, but I'm not sure that he argued that, but if he argued that, I'm not sure he's getting, he's getting it in Israel-Palestine. I, I wish nationalism has lost its allure. Um, in fact, I think the rise of neoliberalism is feeding pretty much uh, nationalism, and it's a new wave of nationalism. 19th century nationalism, as uh, Benedict Anderson wrote once that national movements of elites create nationalism. So it's coming from above. I think the nationalism that we're witnessing now is actually nationalism of the masses. It's a populist nationalism that wants to put limits on the elites, uh, on the frequent flyers of university professors, high tech, um, uh, frequent flyers and other people who uh, float in the global market. So this is um, a new version of nationalism, actually. It's not that, I don't see nationalism losing its relevance. I mean, for those immigrants who try to reach a new country, they see nationalism very clearly on the border with guards and guns and gates. Thank you. I have a short follow-up question and then there are two more from the audience. Um, is the Palestinian struggle a national one or an anti-colonial one or is it neither? Has it always been both? Yeah, I think it's both. It's anti-colonial, it's national. Actually, most of the struggles in the last uh, after the Second World War were anti-colonial and national. So nationalism took the shape of anti-colonialism. And the, the trouble with Palestine is that, um, unlike most other cases where the colonial powers have a place to go back to, like the British or the French, um, the Jews, unless we're talking about the West Bank, there's no place to go back to. In the West Bank, uh, we can speak that we can actually ask the settlers, send the settlers back into Israel. So this is a process of decolonization, definitely, and it's national. Um, but this is a, creates um, a very sensitive situation where the anti-colonial struggle uh, have to formulate itself in very nuanced manner that many anti-colonial movements uh, didn't have to be so subtle. Because I don't know any colonial, settler colonial movement who came with such a moral weight and moral baggage as Zionism does. I don't remember, I can't imagine that anti-colonial struggle was faced not only by guns and brutality and army, but also with a state that claims to represent the essence of the idea of human rights that emerged after the Holocaust. So I think the Palestinian here are facing really very complicated situation and and they have to be more subtle than any other uh, national movement struggling against colonialism. Thank you. That's a good leads us well to the next question. From which grassroots social and political movements do you raise? Uh, do you raise your hope and motivate? Ah, do you raise your hope and motivation nowadays? 
My first hope is the Palestinian people. I mean, in Palestine, there are a few million Palestinians and they're not going to evaporate. So, so this is this is this is the immediate first um, uh, source of hope that there are Palestinians who continue to struggle. Israel cannot give, offer them uh, uh, enough. Uh, I mean, even my argument has been that uh, the PA is really actually um, so corrupted that they are ready let's say to to be bribed by israel politically i mean uh, to, to that israel offers something that allows them to surrender israel is not accepting palestinian surrendering i mean th this is the tragedy of israel and the palestinians actually that, that uh, give them something give them uh, uh, half a state is uh, the current at least the current government is not ready so the first thing is the the Palestinian themselves. Um, at this at this moment, I can't see um, many reasons uh, for hope uh, for the within the Jewish society for the simple reason I don't view politics as good guys and bad guys. The issue is that there's such an attack on Palestine now, and the Palestinians are so weak, and there is no solidarity movement ever in the colonizing country that can develop without that the colonized do something, resist, protest, demand his rights. And we're living in a time where the Palestinians are really in a bad situation that they are not demanding their rights. Now, historically, when the Palestinians stood up and sent a clear message to Israel in the 80s, in the First Intifada, they created a very strong left wing during the 90s. So for me, the idea that there is a left in Israel or there is no left, it's not ontological question. It's a political question. And if there is a Palestinian resistance, a Palestinian protest, uh, combined with uh, some European pressure and American pressure, the Israeli left will wake up. Of course, will wake up. I have no hesitation that it will wake up. But you need, and historically, it has proven that under circumstances, it might uh, wake up. So where do I get some of my optimism? I think. I think I get some of my optimism from my ignorance. Because if you're ignorant, then things could happen in ways that you don't expect. And something might happen from somewhere that you're not looking at, that there are undercurrents that you can't view them, that you can't touch them and they can uh, surprise you. So we all need to do more unlearning and become more ignorant like Leipzig and then the world will be a better place. <laughs> um, next question. In your writings, you have, uh, you have talked about the conditions in which the settler can become a native. Can you talk about concrete steps that Israel or Jewish Israeli individuals could do to reach that? If you want to comment on that, and maybe we'll take like one or two more questions. Yeah, I think take all the questions because we have to close. It's it's nine thirty or so it would be. Yeah. Uh, let, let me let me answer this. No, let's let's do this fast. Uh, so not to lump all. Actually, in my paper, I don't speak about. Uh, settler becoming a native. I was talking about living in a world where being settler and being a native is not a relevant question for politics. It's a question that we put behind, we bracket, uh, that we can live as citizens basically. And the fact that X is a native and X is a settler 
it's a story that you tell to your children that it's a way of being it's a sort of identity it's a sort of uh, a narrative that allows you to understand how you got here in a way to privatize it as we privatize religion when we speak about citizenship so the idea is to collapse the dichotomy not to let people move from one part from one category to the other but actually to collapse the dichotomy as a whole that that, that was my idea yeah okay um would you take one more or should we close yeah. it up we, okay. we take one more um so you're speaking about uh, um, imperialist expanding, and I wonder what uh, if you would maybe give us a last comment uh, on um, what expands and what shrinks at the same time. So uh, maybe um, as an answer to uh, some things are expanding, which spaces do you see uh, around you as an academic, uh, as a Palestinian, as in, in, in the many uh, identities and hats that you wear. Uh, which spaces do you see shrinking while other things are expanding? And uh, do you have any message you wish us to, to uh, carry in that sense? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I got your question, which spaces are... When I speak about uh, expanding imperialism, uh, um, that's uh, that's not my terminology. It's terminology used in the literature to describe how the idea of security has been um, prominent in international law, and that actually allowed the imperialist power, the colonial power, uh, to expand through history. Um, and actually, there are uh, evidence even. In, in the Roman Empire, how the discourse of security went hand in hand with expansion. Um, um, so I, I'm, 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 I'm not sure where, where do you see the, the shrinking? I mean, if there is a, in, in many ways, Israel is not expanding anymore uh, in Sinai or in Lebanon, actually. Israel withdraw from these places, but to overcompensate for the loss of these places and from Gaza, um, it's annexing the West Bank. So it's actually uh, shrinking from one place in order to expand in, in other place. Uh, what message? I mean, I'm not old enough to send messages nor I'm in exile to send messages. I mean, this is remind me of Lenin uh, messages from uh, Finland uh, or the goal. Uh, uh, but I just want to say that, that what you're doing is extremely important. Um, it's more important than you can imagine. And uh, we need each other to go through this. Uh, we need each other as Palestinian and as uh, Jews um, in order to go through this. I mean, um, the process of decolonization is, is complicated. It's complicated. How to uh, decolonize and keep the, the colonialist himself, but make him rid of giving up his privileges is a is a very complicated process and i don't think that the jews can do that on their own so there is a role for the palestinian to play in in this process but i see this as almost there's no way around it i mean if i look 100 years what what other options are genocide i mean uh, think about it what other options there's no other option. Really, there's no other option. And going back to the question of hope, is that no Israeli can 
feel secure now, I think, when he thinks about the future. There's a lack of fantasy on the part of Israeli intelligentsia. They cannot produce fantasies. They can fantasize only with us. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Reifsreck. This was uh, way too short for us. Uh, thank you for uh, taking the time and dedicating your resources, thoughts. Um, everyone is, of course, welcome to look you up and read everything you have written and are yet to write. Uh, we are lucky to have you. And thank you so much. Thank you very much. Keep the good job and uh, good luck. Yes, we will be in touch. Masala. Okay, masala. Bye bye.